for all of you who, are, who came here yesterday, you all know the great, uh, great discourse that Swami gave yesterday. For all the new people that came just today, I want to introduce Swami Ji again, Mahamandaleshwar. Swami Akshay Chaitanya Giri. Swami came for this occasion to grace this occasion, to give blessings to all of us, just for this occasion, all the way from this case. Now I invite Dr. Boyaridi, our council convener, to introduce and uh, uh, say a few words about Swami Ji. Nobody is sitting there, go ahead. I want to since there are several new people today, I uh, would like to reintroduce Swami Ji to everyone. Uh, Swami Abhishek Chaitanya, uh, Chaitanya Giri Maharaj. He is the head of the uh, Jagat Guru Sanyash Ashram in Rishikesh. And he is from the state of Maharashtra from India. And he received a degree in psychology and also behavioral sciences in from the University of Bombay. At that time, he was he was inspired by Gurudev uh, Chinmayanji and enrolled himself as a volunteer in the Yogendra. Subsequently, he became a Brahmachari and he studied Vedanta uh, uh, in the Chinmaya Mission and uh, Swami Anubhavanandi and was later he was appointed as Acharya to the International Residential School in Coimbatore, one of the projects of Chinmay Mission. He was with Chinmay Mission for many years and after that he, was, he wanted to do sadhana on his own and he did intense sadhana on his own and then under Swami Viswasthananda for several years he did intense sadhana. He was bestowed the highest honor, Maha Mandaleshwar, on the banks of Ganges and uh, after that he came in contact with uh, Swami Ramananda who was the head of the Sanyash Ashram at the time and he, 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 was, he was impressed with Swamiji and requested him to be the higher. He was anointed the higher of the ashram. Swamiji has really galvanized the ashram and he spreads himself into many, many activities. He takes care of the orphans and there are several projects dear to him. Some of them are building old age homes for aging Swamiji's and he is fond of Sanskrit language and he promotes Sanskrit language and he is very much interested in yoga and he is affiliated with the Yoga Institute in Malaysia which he visits every year. And he goes to many countries, China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and I had the privilege of inviting Swamiji to USA three years ago. This is his third trip to USA. And his main mission is spread the knowledge of Vedanta. And that is his mission. He has a unique style of uh, teaching Vedanta, and he is a dynamic speaker. And it's our privilege to have him amidst us. And I call it uh, Punyapala, you know, collective Punyapala. And with that introduction, I request Swamiji to uh, start the discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boya, for the generous introduction. If you people have your phones, kindly put them on a silent mode for another 15 or 20 minutes. This is the only time that we have with maximum concentration and minimum distraction that we can make ourselves available to little contemplation will be a blessing to yourself. Purvam 
अग्नियो वै वेदांश्च प्रगिणोति तस्मै तम हेवत्मबुद्धि प्रकाश मुमुक्षुर्वै शरणमह प्रपद्ये ओ शाति शाति ओ नमो ब्रह्मादिभ्यो ब्रह्म विद्या संप्रदाय कर्तृभ्यो वंश ऋषिभ्यो महद्यो नमो गुरुभ्यालवरिता प्रजान घन प्रत्यगर्थो ब्रह्मवा नमस्वी ब्रह्मवाहमस्मी वेदाताभासकाय गुरव शाता संयासी नावादी नगेन्द्र संघपव योगींद्रवंद्याय मोहध्वादिवाकनाय भगवत्दाभिधते तस्म भाष्य नमोस्तु सतत पूर्णा बोधात्म प्रादुर्भाव अपियरेंस ऑफ महालक्ष्मी because the occasion demands as it is the installation prana pratishtha invocation of mahalakshmi we should be discussing how do the puranas present the appearance of mahalakshmi yet i am i left you people with one question and that question was both the consorts parvati as well as mahalakshmi the consort of bhagwan shiva and the consort of bhagwan narayana both of them have something in common and that what is common is parvati is the daughter of himalayas of a mountain and mahalakshmi is the daughter of the ocean and it is not a strange coincidence that why does the shastra why do our scriptures speak in this language when the shakti of the lord has to be presented the scriptures have presented her as a daughter of something that is inert whether it is the mountain or it is the ocean something that is extremely deep and something that is extremely high tall there has to be some correlation depth and height are not two different phenomena higher you climb deeper it becomes 
deeper you go, higher something becomes. When you start climbing a mountain, higher you go, the valley keeps on becoming deeper and deeper. When you sink into the to, the, to touch the bottom of the ocean, the surface becomes higher and higher. Height and depth are two sides of the same coin. Parvati is shown as to be the daughter of that what is tall, high, and Mahalakshmi is the daughter of something that is deep. Both of these and both of these places from where the goddess is born is inert. Himalaya, icy mountain and the ocean, the water, that is the water in fluid form, water in crystallized form and water in a fluid form. Both. On one hand you have the ocean which has got enormous number of life forms to support. The mountains also has animals and birds, worms and insects various forms of life that it supports. And here are both the sources. The irony of our life is that we are presented. Either you are the devotees of Vishnu or you are the devotees of Shiva. And if the compartmentalization is so strong as if they are you are standing in two enemy camps. The Vishnu devotees are said to be against Shiva devotees. And mind you, the scriptures are showing that there is no distinction. Nobody is against anyone. But here you have the politicians, spiritual leaders creating this division. Scriptures want you to see the truth. Scriptures are not interested in creating political camps. The Shastra is not interested in creating a cult. The Shastra is more interested in showing you what that supreme reality is. Whether that reality comes to you in form of Narayana, or that reality comes to you in form of Bhagawan Shiva. That is irrelevant. But you should become available to realize that truth. That is more important. And this is just not important from the standpoint of knowledge, but this is extremely important even from the standpoint of Bhakti. Because we will have people who are going to say Bhakti means you should be a Krishna Bhakta or you should be a Shiva Bhakta. And if you are a Shiva Bhakta, you have to prove you are a Shiva Bhakta by showing your strong opposition to Krishna Bhakti. If you are a Krishna Bhakta, you will have to prove your loyalty by showing how against you are, against Shiva and the devotees of Shiva. And mind you, save yourself from this because this is, this is just a useless political agenda. The realization of the truth has got nothing to do with this compartmentalization. Truth does not depend on number. More number of people means it has to be true. That is just another silly concept. More number of people do not determine whether it is a fact or not. 
A fact is a fact whether many number of people believe in it, follow it or not. Fact does not wait for numbers to prove it. Number is always a political game. How many people, how many followers? That is silly. Well, I want you to see one more thing and that is even from the Bhakti the standpoint, the Bhakti Sutras begin the inaugural sutra of Narada. Narada's Bhakti Sutra is Athato Atha Bhakti Vyakya Syama. Athato Brahma Jinyasa is the Brahma Sutras. Athato Dharma Jinyasa is the Dharma Sutras. But here you have Bhakti Vyakya Syama. And the next sutra goes Satu Tasmin Parama Prema Rupa. The sutra is saying Satu Tasmin Parama Prema Rupa.